Hey, I'm James from Soaking Dad Barbecue, and today we are tackling the granddaddy, the big one. We're doing a brisket direct with the Joe Tisserie over a live fire. Let me tell you all about it. Ever since Jeremy, AKA Mad Scientist Barbecue, shared a rotisserie brisket, my inbox has been full of two main questions. First, James, since we have something like the Joe Tisserie in our Kamado Joe, can we use it to cook large cuts of beef, whether it be beef ribs or things like a brisket as uh, Jeremy demonstrated in his video? And while this breaks my heart a little bit, the YouTube algorithm hasn't shown you videos that I've done a few years ago like direct fire beef ribs, that's beyond the point. Jeremy, however, though, did cook a brisket and I've not yet tried that on the rotisserie. So to get ready for today's experiment, I've done a few more experiments of my own, starting with direct versus indirect. One of the questions I always have, particularly when we start throwing every deflector that Komodo Joe makes inside of our grills, is there something that we can bring it back and dial down the simplicity? And direct live fire cooking is, not only is it super enjoyable where you get to interact with your food and the coals directly, it's a lot easier to set up. And so to put this to a test, I did direct ribs versus my indirect ribs but the direct ribs turned out to get a leathery bottom and we just weren't burning enough of a clean fire to impart the same quality smoke. So back for round two, I switched to the jotisserie, which time in and time again has turned out a winner on things like turkey, chickens, or even those live fire beef ribs that I did uh, a couple years ago. So the jotisserie is part of the game plan for today. Now, in terms of how it compares, you'd be forgiven for being a little confused in terms of how Jeremy ranks his best ever briskets. These accolades have been shared across a number of different tools, whether it be the Twin Eagle pellet grill that he did the rotisserie cook on, something like the Birch Barrel, which is burning a live fire, the Franklin Offset, TMG Offset, Camp Chef pellet grill, and the list goes on. So if you're like me and a little bit confused in terms of what really is the best brisket ever and how does the rotisserie brisket fare, that's what I want to unpack a little bit today. And since I just recently achieved my own personal best brisket on a Kamado style grill, using a shocking accessory here, the Dojo, because it moves four times more air using an aeronometer than the slow roller does in a traditional Kamado Joe setup, I want to find out if Kamado Joe's other accessory here, the Jotisserie, is going to take our brisket game even further. If you plan to follow along with me at home and give this a try, a quick word of caution. So I'm doing this video on my Kamado Joe Big Joe Series 3 as it is four inches taller than something like my Big Joe Series 1. Big Joe Series 1 and Series 2 are the same height. Earlier this fall, I tried to do a live fire jotisserie cook on my Big Joe Series 1 using Kamado Joe's basket accessory on a leg of lamb as I thought it would help the leg of lamb not be struggling with spinning, twisting, or anything falling down. But as I discovered in that video, two main issues. The four inches closer to the fire when fat started to drip, I got a massive uh, inferno and had to abort that plan very quickly. The other issue I discovered right away is that there is not space in my series one to use the Joe Tissery basket as the arms protrude and fit a heat deflector or what I'm gonna use today, the soapstone underneath of it. If you do have a series one and series two, the only way to get it to fit is to use the Joe Tissery without Kamado Joe's Joe Tissery basket and place a heat deflector stone directly on your charcoal basket. Anything above and beyond like the setup that I'm gonna show you today will not work unfortunately in a series one or series two. Now that you know a little bit of my method for my madness in terms of which grill to pick and why for something like a jotisserie cook, like always, I'm gonna borrow a page out of something like my jotisserie turkey video most recently where I showed placing a deflector stone or today I'm gonna to use the soapstone for even more coverage. The soapstone is what I used when I pulled off a live fire brisket cook going back a couple years ago inside of my Kamado Joe because that's just going to give us the largest surface area and on any direct cook where we are putting our food directly above a live fire we need some protection for things that are going to take all day to get some heat to break down something like that. This isn't a chicken shawarma or al pastor or anything like that that's going to be done in an hour to two hours. This is going to be on the grill facing direct heat for hours and I just don't think that we'll be able to get away without any protection even if we had our coals banged all the way to the back. So now that you're up to speed on the setup and the methodology, let's get the uh, brisket out. I'll show you a quick little trim as well as the seasoning that I'm going to do based off of our family's favorite things from the top three Texas rubs and we'll get it on our spit on the Joe's history. I'll meet you over there in a second. Get our big Joe ready. Start by removing the divide and conquer rack. We're not going to need that today. 
remove our charcoal basket, shake out the loose ash, remove our kick ash can, I'll go dump that. And I'm also gonna try placing a piece of smoke wood in the kick ash can. I know using the dojo that worked brilliantly. I wanna see with the rotisserie, if I just place a loose piece here, it'll be easy for us to check at the end of the cook if that actually burned. Let me go dump this. So I already know from my direct rib experiment as well as my jotisserie ribs that we do not burn our fuel as aggressively as we do with the double indirect setup. And I'm, we knew this all along, that's in part why it exists. But I'm gonna place, uh, we'll do one, two, three, get just those pieces there at the back and when our cook is all done we'll check and see on the status if we're able to get enough heat with a partially uh to see if we're able to get enough heat with a partial heat deflector and otherwise wide open rotisserie cooking to do anything to touch these three pieces of wood reinstall our charcoal basket in case those pieces of wood don't go i'll do the normal one piece of wood for about this amount of charcoal at the bottom Add a little bit more fresh fogo, grab our grow blazer grow gun, fire it up. That looks good. So after about one minute, we've got white ashed over coals as well as some open flame. That's exactly what we want. At this point, our bottom vent is open. Our top vent is all the way open, but I am not going to install a deflector. It's imperative that we get as much heat into our ceramics to unlock the benefit of that radiant heat coming from our ceramics. For right now, we're just going to let this warm up until the ceramic passes the hand test. I'll show you that in a little bit. Let's go prep our brisket. So as I was getting everything out to trim and season our brisket, I realized I've run out of my rub. So I'm just gonna make up a quick batch. If you've seen this, by all means, just go ahead and skip till uh, we are working on our brisket. But this is a rub made up of my favorite things from the brisket rub, the blacks rub, as well as the Goldie's rub. So in the Goldie's rub, you can see right here, we've got larger granular pieces of garlic. So I've started to incorporate some larger pieces of granular garlic in the blacks rub. Try and find a spot you might be able to see come through on camera. Hopefully that's showing there, but you can see some of those red pepper flakes. Uh, that was one of the things that uh, the family really liked. It adds a great bit of flavor. And of course, uh, I've run out of the uh, Texas uh, brisket rub. So the Franklin's comes in two parts, the salt and pepper, which I still have, uh, as well as more of a, a reddish orange uh, brisket rub, which we're gonna get from some of the turmeric and things like that in our Lowry's. So uh, let's start making up our rub. I'm gonna make more than what I need. If I was doing just uh, our brisket, I think one capful uh, of our pepper cannon would be enough, but I'm gonna go for three capfuls, um, which should give me close, when we're all done, about three quarters of a rub bottle, and I'll be able to use this in future recipes. So I'll take you fast forward while I start to get our pepper cannon in fast forward and get three capfuls of pepper. Each capful, if you were following along and you're not using a pepper cannon, is worth about two tablespoons of whatever uh, dry rub ingredient that we are grinding up. Okay, so we're already there with our boat first, so I'm filling to the line on the bottom of the pepper cannon. And since I get asked this all the time, and I actually don't check, I just like the, the look of the pepper, let me count back uh, where we are on our settings. So if I were to work our way towards fine and I'll just come back there. So we're, so that was 23 clicks from the finest settings. Let me put that back. Perfect. Let's keep grinding up some more pepper. And our third. So I'll retain the uh, cap for measurement here, but now I'm going to go for salt. So since I've done three capfuls, I'm going to do two parts diamond crystal. So one, two, we need a little bit more to get the other part of the Franklin's rub incorporated. So we're only, we're not, so we're not quite 50-50 salt, but you can see we now have matched nearly the Franklin's rub for salt and pepper. So let's get the other part of the Franklin's rub, which I find tastes very similar to Lowry's. If you can't find Lowry's in your area, I have a recipe on my website. Have to get used to uh, saying that where you can make your own. I'll put a link down below. If you do have Lowry's, we're gonna do one third of Lowry's. So two thirds uh, diamond crystal kosher salt, one third or one cap full of Lowry's. So next you can see in the Goldies and the Black Shrub, we have a little bit more of our red color. So I'm gonna do that by adding a little bit of paprika and a little bit of cayenne pepper. So I'm gonna split my cap into two thirds paprika and one third cayenne. 
So at this point, we're looking now a little bit redder than either rub, but that's because we have not added in our garlic or our onion powder. So let's do that. I'm going to do half cap garlic, remaining half cap onion. And if you're thinking that was, uh, James, that's a little bit light on garlic, that's because we're going to add an entire cap of this whole grain or coarse grain garlic. And last but not least, a cap of red pepper flakes. Give this a mix. Perfect. There's our rub. Let's get it on. So while we were making up our rub, our grill has started to come up to temperature and pass the hand test where I am feeling some nice heat in the upper part of our dome. And so I've gone ahead at this point and adjusted the bottom vent down to a single finger. And then I put the top vent a little bit further than what I want. Normally I would go for about an eighth of an inch past the first line. Right now I am at the 50% mark between the first line and the second line on our control tower top to help slow down the rate of the fire ramping up. So by the time we're done trimming our brisket, we're not looking at a five, 600 degree uh, Kamados. Let's get to work on trimming our brisket. This is a full packer brisket from Costco. Uh, when I shop for these at Costco, I am looking for the thinnest part of the flat to still be about two fingers width. Some of them will taper right down to paper thin, and I find uh, we have to trim that off in order to uh, get a good result. So this one is exactly uh, 15 pounds, 10 ounces. So let's get to work on trimming it up and seasoning it and get it on our spit. Get this as dry as we can. All right, let's get to work on trimming. Now, had uh, we planned a little bit better, the ideal time would have been to do this yesterday so that we could apply our rub and get the benefits of an overnight dry brine. So today, this is just a uh, bad James, bad YouTuber versus uh, the best possible dry brine result. If you have the time and the plan, I definitely recommend doing that. So I will not fault our jotisserie brisket in any way for lack of salt all the way down through the thickest cuts of the meat. Cause my worry or my skepticism here is that uh, the bark is not going to form uh, properly being exposed to the rotisserie heat through the extent of our cook. So that's really what I want to focus in on. I'm gonna give this a quick trim. If you haven't seen, I've done a, uh, a trim versus no trim brisket video. And I was shocked at the no trim brisket video coming out uh, as good as the one that I put a lot of effort into. So I'm not gonna spend too much time here, just get some of the larger pieces of silver skin or fat on the bottom. So I'm just cleaning up. You can see some of these score lines cuts from the butcher. Normally I wouldn't worry about coming this far down into the flat, but I just didn't wanna have any huge undulations. But as far as trims go, I think that is about it. That's all I'm going to worry about. So now I wanna get a, an application of our rub and we'll keep the rub out just in case we need to reapply a little bit after we install our spit as all the handling of the brisket is sure to knock a little bit of that off. Give our rub a good shake and apply. You notice I keep stopping to shake when we have heavier components like the red pepper flakes as well as those larger granular uh, pieces of garlic. If I were not to stop and do this, they would all sink to the bottom and all the salt would rise to the top. So we would not be getting sort of an equal distribution of our flavor. So that's why I'm stopping and shaking. Okay, our brisket is all trimmed and rubbed up and looks amazing. So now for the fun part, to try and get it on our rotisserie spit. Okay, so for placing our spit, I've put a notch on my jotisserie right here. I don't know if that's coming through on camera. So I know the midway point is going to be uh, right about here. So I'm not sure I'll be able to see that. So we might have to fuss with our forks once we get it on. Uh, in terms of installing our spit, we could go sort of directly in the middle or from the thickest point in the flat to the longest end uh, in the point. But I'm worried that that will be a little bit uneven in terms of how it's rotating. So I think, uh, uh, just trying to find a nice path right through the middle and balance the weight left to right will help make sure that we don't run into any problems with our jotisserie motor. We can spin up to 50 pounds, but that is an asterisk only for anything balanced. Uh, I know from turkeys and other things, we don't get our balancing right. Uh, this is just going to spin and grind away at the motor. So that's the game plan. I'll take you fast forward while I try and install our spit without uh, breaching our brisket uh, as we work our way through. All right, we are through. So there's one part right at the very end. We're crossing through the decal between our flat and our point end was a little difficult, so I just had to flip it and rely 
on the force of gravity to help punch through without getting that uh, right into my finger. Let's uh, get our forks on to try and help hold everything in place. I'm not going to go too tight right now since I think we're going to have to reposition this once we get it on the jotisserie. Okay, it feels pretty balanced when I'm flipping around, so I think our jotisserie shouldn't have any problem. Let's go install it on the jotisserie. Okay, we are again uh, completely heat soaked now, so even hotter to the point where I only want to hold my hand two, three seconds and it's getting a little bit warm for comfort, so I think that is the perfect temperature. So my game plan, I know this from doing many different turkeys, is that we want to, is that we want to focus on our bark or in the case of turkey, our skin at the very end of our cook. If we start too early getting too much bark, we're gonna have potentially burnt bark on the outside and a nice medium rare brisket. So my game plan to solve for this, just like I've done with a live fire brisket uh, a couple years ago where I cooked a brisket completely with wood, is to use my soapstone as a deflector, since it's gonna give me the largest area of protection from the fire and we can remove that at the end of our cook when we are ready to ramp up exposing our brisket and have some of those fat drippings fall into our fire. Drop in a grid on the back of our firebox, our soapstone. And again, we'll have to confirm here that we've got enough clearance between our soapstone and our jotisserie for the brisket not to be colliding our brisket which I think we're going to be okay, just avoiding the bottom of our soapstone. Let's check our alignment here. Beginner's luck, I actually think that looks perfect. Just confirm we're not hitting. Yeah, it's close, but we're good. I'm gonna slide in a meter probe, close up our dome to settle down the fire. Okay, we are now six hours into our cook and I'll show you the meter chart here. You can see some of the dips, but about every hour in a bit, I've been spraying our, or spritzing our brisket with a little bit of this Golden Mountain seasoning sauce. I saw my friend Steve from Smoke Trails Barbecue say that this was a tip shared with him that this is something that they use at the Franklin's Barbecue Restaurant. He did a whole video testing it out and seemed impressed with the results. So since I didn't do my normal overnight dry brine, I thought, maybe we get a little bit more flavor using that to spritz versus using my normal 50% water and 50% apple cider vinegar. But if we're honest, the real reason is we ran out of apple cider vinegar in the store didn't have any, and I had that in the shelf. So that's why I'm giving that a go. So once our brisket reached around 145 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature, I was noticing that we were not getting much in the way of bark formation. And so to try and help get a little bit more color, a little bit more bark, I opted to remove the deflector plates and then start to rake some of the coals to the side and then try and move them around depending on where we are getting some hot spots. I put best effort here, but I'm not sure I can call this a bark versus burning. Only the taste test will really reveal whether this is a burnt brisket or a great bark forming on our brisket, but I don't think I can get any more color and we have nearly burnt through all of our charcoal if I show you a quick clip of what it looks like right behind me as we're recording this. And so after six hours and only at about 175 degrees internal Fahrenheit, my game plan here is to move to a long hot hold. There are two factors that are gonna help us render that intermuscular fat. There's time and temperature. And since I can't take any more time at the temperature inside of our grill without completely nuking the bark, the other way to achieve this is gentle heat for a long time. Not only do all the top barbecue restaurants use a long hot hold, uh, this is actually something that makes a lot of sense in the backyard. If it's a day like today where we started later, I think it was around 10, 10.30 this morning when we got the brisket on, so this was not gonna be done for dinner no matter what we did without getting a proper rest, the long hot hold is going to allow me to carry this overnight by dialing my oven down by negative 29 degrees Fahrenheit for me in order for it to hold 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Check your oven settings if you have an option to do that. So let's get over to the pit, get our brisket off, and then we are going to wrap it up in foil, add a little bit of tallow just like the Goldie's method and put it to rest until tomorrow. So unfortunately for me, I have to wait all the way until tomorrow to give this amazing looking brisket and some parts a taste test, but for you, it'll be just like this. Well, just like that, our 17 hour long hot hold rest is over. I've got our brisket out of the package and I'm nervous to slice into this and see what we have. And my anxiety level didn't drop at all as I was removing this out of the foil. And we still have a bit of that curve shape. I was hoping maybe it would relax a little bit more in the long hot hold, but we still have a little bit of brisket 
twist going on. So let's come nice and close, slice into it, and see if our fears are warranted or if we're gonna have some delicious brisket on our hand. All right, moment of truth. Let's go into our point. Well, it didn't cut as bad as I thought it felt. It looks, a, it looks dry, definitely down here on the bottom, but not as bad as I was expecting for the speed of the cook on some of the, the fat cap render. This actually looks pretty good. Right here, we've got yellow squishy fat. It's this stuff right here that to me is a little bit of the warning signs where we've got some of this visible white intermuscular fat. Let's take a look towards our flat end. And very similarly, again, I can still see some of that connective tissue does not look properly rendered. And again, so this is pulled off 175 because I don't think our bark can take any more and 17 hours in a long hot hold. We've got what looks like, okay, uh, smoke ring. We've got, okay, fat cap, but I think we're going to be in for a little bit of a dry bite. Let's find out. Getting a look a little bit further up into our flat. This looks better. This is more promising than our point end where we've got that proper rendered look. I'm just even touching that and fat is running out. And once again, on the bottom, this looks very dry. I'm not sure why so dry on the bottom, given that we're on a rotisserie. There really is no top end versus bottom end. Let's get a slice or two out here. That's feeling, that's feeling dry. So you'll see right here, we're not getting the proper flop. This is still wanting to resist folding over and touching the bottom. I mean, not terrible, not great. Plus we also visually have the whole of our spit to deal with. Let's give it a pull. Yeah, that's taking a lot of force. This feels still like it's got a springboard in it. So not a good sign, but let's dive in and see how it tastes. All right, moment of truth. Start with our point end. Cheers. Well, let's start with our positive. The seasoning is great, <laughs> homemade has everything that I love about Franklin's, Goldie's, as well as Black's. That's about it for the list of positives on our point end. Let's dive into our flat and see if there's any chance of redemption over there. I don't think so. This is the worst brisket I've cooked in as long as I can remember. So just like on our point end, the really only redeeming quality, the only enjoyable part of this brisket is the outer eighth of an inch or so where we have our seasoning and there is that rendered fat cap. Everything else beyond this is pretty terrible. So unlike perhaps in the Mad Scientist video, I'm not a grill manufacturer, so that Twin Eagle pellet grill trying to show off the rotisserie, I have no vested interest if this is a good idea or bad idea. I don't make a commission if you buy a Kamado Joe or a Joe Tisserie or anything like that. I just wanna focus on, is the rotisserie brisket a good idea. And maybe we should break rotisserie into a couple categories. If you read Texas Monthly, there was an article not too long ago about rotisseries taking back over Texas barbecue joints as it helps solve a couple practical problems in terms of ease of running a fire as well as capacity. On something like MM barbecue rotisserie units, you can actually fit more briskets in a confined space than what you can on an offset. So rotisseries helping with fire management makes sense. Rotisseries helping increase your capacity and yield in terms of square footage and displacement makes a bunch of sense. But what about for the rotisserie in the backyard where most of the designs here are a spit directly through the brisket? So for the positives, I'm honestly struggling to find any advantage of this. We have the spit rod directly through our brisket. so. It has that visual look to it that doesn't look great. We don't gain any capacity. The Big Joe Series 3 that I've used, I can fit three briskets normally on there, no problem. And with the rotisserie configuration, I can barely fit one brisket. Our bark is not better. Our tenderness is not better. Our flavor is not better. Our smoke ring is not better. So while I may continue to love my rotisserie for short cooks, things like turkey, chicken, picanha steaks or chicken wings over the live fire. It does an absolutely great job. I just can't see one advantage, if I'm honest, that the rotisserie injects into our brisket experience on a long, slow cook. Sure, it intuitively has no hot spot on the bottom as you're rotating all the way through, but there are better ways to solve this as uh, I've documented many times inside of Kamado Joe. So if you're trying to solve for bottom heat, maybe like on that Twin Eagle pellet grill that Jeremy was using in his video, if it has a heat 
reflector or something like that's getting hot perhaps through history solves the radiant heat coming from the bottom but I think something like a foil boat or going for more distance from our fire is a better way of solving that problem, especially when it comes at the cost of everything else. This may have a dark color looking bark, but this is really not a bark. This is the most disappointing bark I've cooked in as long as I can remember. So color of black and how well it might look on camera is nothing like the mouthfeel, the taste, or the texture of this bark compared to a properly developed bark, especially if I was doing it on something like one of my offset smokers where you get that amazing bark texture. This is just colored black with a little bit of smoke ring to give your eyes something potentially to look forward to, followed by immediate, dis followed by immediate disappointment. So there you have it, $100 down the drain, but all is not lost. If you saw my video a couple weeks ago on five ideas you can do with brisket leftovers, something like a chili or a stew or nachos, I'm gonna be able to salvage this, but this again is not something that I could recommend. I'm, so I'm gonna give the rotisserie brisket two thumbs down. That's it for today. I'm James with Sofa Dad Barbecue signing off. And remember, don't be afraid to fire it up without the rotisserie maybe. Thank you